We read an article in the LA Times about homeless and formerly homeless men and women who create fine arts paintings on Skid Row. Painters on the Nickel? The Nickel refers to Fifth Street, the center of LA's Skid Row, the bottom of Life's Barrel. What drives homeless people to make art? People struggling just to survive still create things? The idea pulled us in. To our own guilty amazement, in many years of living in Los Angeles, neither of us had ever been to Skid Row. We learned that LA is the homeless capital of America, with nearly 100,000 homeless men, women, and children. Many sleep on the streets. Skid Row is a shock. It smells. It's dangerous. And it's noisy. When night falls, they appear from nowhere and raise their tents or construct their shanty places, their cardboard condos. There are many disabled people, including veterans, forgotten heroes of past and current wars. The police dump ex-convicts on Skid Row. Hospitals dump discharged patients on Skid Row. When mentally ill people are too sick to know they are sick and then forget to take their medication, they wind up on Skid Row. But the artists intrigued us. Dedicated painters who live, work, and create their art despite the odds on Skid Row. what it's called. It's full of a lot of people that don't have a lot of money who are trying to survive in this world. I knew there were artists down here who were self-taught and who were making their art. And what I did was I started the workshop and I didn't tout it as uh, anything, any teaching or anything. It was a place for artists to meet and make their art. And that's what it still is. It's a place for artists to meet and make their art. Now, did you make this background, or did you, is this something you found? Uh, it's something I found in an old wallpaper book. Uh-huh, it's beautiful. And you put these little birds on. And I collaged on top of it. You know, you're doing something very unique with collage. This and is wonderful. More recently, I've got into mixing cloth uh -huh. with paper. I and, like that. And, and layering paper and cloth and paper and cloth. And I think it might be a good idea for us to stretch some of that cloth over some, some stretchers to see yeah, how that I, works. I, I would like to try that. I've yeah. never tried that. I would, I've always used cardboard or I love the cardboard. Know, available material. I love the cardboard. Available material for these artists is often found in trash cans. Those who have jobs paint after long hours of hard work. Some don't have a job or any income. They range from average ability to the very talented. But that doesn't matter, since they don't paint for money or glory. They all need to create as much as they need to breathe and eat. Break down the mountains like this here. That's a little mountain. The people in my art workshop, some of them are ex-drug addicts, ex-convicts, whatever. But they're not now. Yeah. Benito Compito, a.k.a. OG Man. Estoy Filipino Negro. I mean, I'm part Filipino and Nick. Uh, I went to prison for uh, armed robbery. You know, I, I did like five and a half years. 
and I had an opportunity to watch a lot of different artists. Man, there's some great artists in there. And and I was telling somebody, I don't know if uh, all the artists I met, they always shared things, you know, a different technique. You can't really do what another person do, but uh, they share different stuff, you know, different shading techniques, and you know, you know, different styles of doing stuff. Even when I was younger, I used to do patterns for tattoos. And I would come out at night, and I would sketch people on the streets. And I, it was amazing. I mean, and the scenes that you would see, I mean, you know, some, t some, people, some people say they, uh, they're depressing, you know. Like this picture here, this picture here is a friend of mine. This, he, he, he sits right at this corner, right? This, this is, that's right down in St. Julian and um, 6th Street. That's his place, that's, what, that's his living quarters. And he sits out there all the time, you know. And uh, that's, to me, that's a heck of a scene right there, you know what I mean? You know, you can't capture that scene. And that's how he lives. He got his suitcase, he got his bags, you know. And uh, somebody told me that picture was very depressing. But when I was looking at the gentleman, the man is very at peace. You know, you never know what, you know, he, I don't know what his night was, what his day was, but he is at peace. Well, I got friends that are still on drugs and stuff like that, and I know a certain time, that'd be the only time they ever get any rest. You know what I mean? The only time they were kind of away from the, from the world is when they're sleeping. This guy right here, I was at Persian Square one time, and that's where I got that picture from. And this picture over here, that's in front of Fred Jordan Mission. OG man, I consider him a self-taught artist. He's creating the world around him. He thinks it's fascinating what's happening around him, and so he creates it in art. I don't know if she really liked my work. I was doing, I, at the time, I was doing a lot of Laker stuff, you know, and I was, I was trying to make a little money on the side selling Laker pictures just when the Lakers were winning. And, um, you mean like portraits of the players? I would, yeah, I do a lot of, uh, you know, I do a lot of Shaqs and Kobe's. I do a lot of Shaq and Kobe's. I, as a matter of fact, one time I did the whole team the first year they won. OG man will tell you he loves to draw his pictures of the basketball players, and but Lillian doesn't like me to do it in the class. <laughs> Uh, Denzel Washington, I got Oprah Renfrey, Holly Berry, I got, uh, I got, I, I, I got Natalie Cole and her father, you know, I got, uh, and I do, you know what else I do? I do uh, Harry Potter. A lot of them like to sit down and open a magazine and copy pictures of movie stars out of magazines. So that's fine, that's good practice, but I'd rather you copy the masters. And then I show them a painting of a master, copy this. Or, or, or make work out of your imagination, but don't copy portraits of famous people. I think it's essential for our souls to experience and be artists. We, I think everyone should be an artist. Everyone should be creating. Uh, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the creators and the destroyers. And I think being a creator is the best thing to be. To a bus driver, and I drove all over Southern California. I've been on every street. I drove uh, 97 different lines. The first time I got down here, I had injured myself and I lost my income. I couldn't work, and I didn't have no income, and I got evicted. And I went to the city trying to get help, and they gave me a referral, and the referral was right here at the mission. And my daughter was with me then. I grew up in L.A. This is my home. And I never had never saw Skid Row before. But really, I didn't even know what a shelter was. I was shocked. I thought God hated me. I thought God didn't love me no more to send me down here. I wasn't mad at the people the way they looked. I was just mad at the, situ the situation, circumstance of me having to come down here. You know, because it looked so bad, it smelled so bad and all these weird looking people, weird acting people. I swear I when I first came down here, I was angry. You only want to draw when you're happy and peaceful. You don't draw when you're angry. Because drawing is a joy. A writer is doing the same thing I'm doing. A writer is writing about what they see, I'm drawing about what I'm seeing, all right? This one is the people over there playing cards, that table right there, 
and this one is the table in the back, the dominoes, and this one is this table right here. All right, this one, this one is my fiance, Wendell, and these are some of his friends. They was playing uh, cards. I sat in the window of the hotel and, and drew this. All the details. The Los Angeles Mission. Where is that mission? Right there across the street. Right across the street from me. The two flags, the trees, I got to finish coloring it. And it got that round center, that's the way it goes. Round center, then it goes straight. I thought that was tight, the way they did that. So I came back here voluntarily on my own because I felt like I had enough in me and something in me to make a difference. I help the kids at the mission. I give the kids things. I, I gather up things when I see it for the kids. It's the kids are depressed. I try to give to the ladies' kids, so they know me over there, too. Yeah, they all love me. They say I'm an angel. I say, I'm not no angel. See, they believe it anyway. If these people could draw, well, I mean, if they could do art, work, period, painting, stuff like that, it would change the way they feel. And when I paint, I feel better. It is a therapy for people. It is, it is a powerful therapy, powerful. Yeah, and there's approximately 100,000 homeless people in Los Angeles. And a third of them are, have a serious mental illness. I have a degree in English from UCLA, and I taught sixth grade for five years. I am diagnosed as bipolar, and I had been living homeless in Hollywood for several months, and I lived in a graveyard, and I ate mushrooms, and I ate out of trash bags, and I, it was my first time being homeless. I had a Datsun 1200 that I lived in for about 11 months. In the back seat, I, I, I got a L-shaped piece of wood and I put it on the back seat, and, and on the front I had a support. And then that was my bed and my coffee table. I was at Tarzana Treatment Center, um, recovering from alcoholism. A totally uh, residential program, to where you didn't leave at all, to be released to the Skid Row area. Even though I've lived in Los Angeles my whole life, nothing could have prepared me for uh, how bad that it was. It's a very obvious thing if someone is creating, they're not just sitting there trying to think of a reason why they shouldn't be smoking crack. The Lamp Art Project is uh, an open studio here in Skid Row. It offers a space and nurturing environment for artists and other human beings. Uh, all human beings are artists that have diagnoses of mental illness and have been homeless here in Skid Row. Now, that really is all-inclusive because uh, the way we looked at it is that there's those people on the planet who know they have a mental diagnosis, and then there's those people who don't know. So it kind of encompasses everyone. LAMP is an organization that helps mentally ill people. And as such, uh, I became a member. They help me because they have an advocate available that I can talk to if I have anything that I need to get done that I don't know how to do. Here at the Art Project is a very nurturing environment to where we feel important. And we feel like what we're doing is what we're supposed to be doing is important. So that eventually, maybe we can have a show and have a body of work, because you can't have a body of work with one or two paintings. I've done about 50 paintings. The focus is on the act of creation. That's basically my goal, not People here have diagnoses and they need these things to help lift the poor things up from the gutter. That's not my attitude, it's not how I see it at all. And of course, the actual experience, as you've been witnessing coming here and filming the artists, is that these are great human beings, deep individuals with great visions inside of them that create great work. I reach inside of myself and I pull out something that's very special, that, that, that's uniquely me. It's a self-actualization. Can I throw that word around? You know, you, you really self-actualize. You find out who you are. It's exciting to, to, cre to be creative. I, find, I think that life is about being creative. I don't care if you're a good cook and you fix a, one hell of a pizza for your husband when he comes home from work, or whether you are a good gardener and can make roses grow three times bigger than your next door neighbor. Creativity is an essential part of life for me. If you look at 
Vincent Van Gogh's life, where you have a great artist who had a significant diagnosis of a mental illness. Van Gogh created this tremendous body of work in very severe circumstances, extreme poverty, ridicule by others, including the artists around him even. Van Gogh killed himself in his 30s. What I look for in the art project is to try to provide that missing ingredient, if possible, that can make just that much of a difference in terms of a component of nurturing and esteem, where the person could go on another day instead of kill themselves that day, and where they won't, where the amount of anguish that's living inside of their belly each day is minimalized to the degree that it can be helped with the esteem of others and nurturing. Coming here gives me a feeling of belonging. Otherwise, I would be isolating in my little apartment. And I, I try to paint at home, too, but it's not at all the same. Some artists create art totally homeless, on the street, right on the sidewalk. But a lot of artists, it's just too overwhelming. It's just too much. There's a lot of things they have to go through. They got to get into a housing situation. They have to has to be one friendly enough that they can handle, and they have to learn how to socialize. Again, that can be difficult. A lot of times, they have to go through drug and alcohol recovery, getting benefits so they have some some type of money coming in because of their disability. So there's quite a few obstacles, and they have to get back to the point where they're finally sitting in front of a canvas or a piece of paper with a pencil and get back to creating and not have their own inner voices telling them they're no good, uh, they're, they're worthless, why should they create? That's no good. Uh, all the different voices that every artist, much less someone that has schizophrenia or any type of mental diagnosis has. It, it, it's hard, it's hard seeing especially people that you know, that you care about being on the streets or using drugs or drinking, it, it's real hard. And, and also, the mortality rate down here is real high. So you deal with that a lot down here. You know, people don't take care of themselves or they let their uh, illnesses get out of control and they don't go see doctors and stuff. I've known about 10 people who have died since I've been down here. One reason people do not have a lot of empathy for people with homelessness is they think they're just bringing it on themselves. They don't realize that a few catastrophes can happen in their life and they will be in Skid Row. They will be homeless. Oh, I used to have a good house. I, when, when I was teaching and getting having a good salary, I lived in Westwood in a beautiful, beautiful apartment in a beautiful part of the uh, part of Los Angeles. But I have a mental illness, and I keep getting sick. I'll start to work, and I'll start to be fine, and I'll get a job, and then I'll not sleep, and then I'll have to I'll I'll have to go in the hospital. And I take my medication, but I'm what is called a rapid cycler. And when you're a rapid cycler, even though you take your medication you still have ups and downs. Worked as a nurse's aide for about 20 some years. Then I, then I had my, um, how do you say, it, burnout, where something happened that I left my work and came down here to LA and wound up on the skid row. I was just drug into a frivolous court case for no reason. The number of Attorneys up in Monterey County, where I lived in Big Sur Carmel area, pulled it in as an innocent third party in a large custody case and was basically destroyed by a bunch of lawyers for a number of years. It was a huge court case. My art dealing world was just crushed by it. I, I lost everything I had because I was in court the entire time fighting this case. I won the case, but that didn't give me anything financially. It's just I was vindicated from this nonsense. In that time period, I lost my home, my home that I'd owned for many, many years in Big Sur. The case was very devastating emotionally, therefore I, I developed a very severe post-traumatic stress disorder. I couldn't sleep at all for a couple of years, or I could sleep maybe two hours a night for five nights in a row, then I'd basically sleep almost in a coma-like sleep. Could not get loans anymore, credit cards, any of that. I have to take whatever possessions I have, and I take them to the pawn shop, and they're the collateral, and they make me a loan. You know, I actually have two bankers. One is Angelo's Pawn Shop right in downtown Santa Monica. And then there's another one uh, down in the more Hollywood area on Melrose called Brothers, Collateral Lenders. Uh, lenders to the Stars, I think they call themselves. <laughs> they have a lot of musical instrument guitars and things like that. And the other half of my possessions live there. And if I need to use my camera, I have to go in, like right after a paycheck, 
redeem it, give them all the money I owe them, pull it out, say, to hold a little space for it, I'll be back in a couple of days, take pictures like crazy, get them processed, take the camera back, and there it goes back into Angelo's or Brothers and lives happily ever after, waiting for me to come get it again. I'm working currently on some very large canvases uh, at home. I live in a very, very tiny uh, apartment. It's tinier than the little SROs that like Darlene and these other people live in. I was living in the mountains and wilderness of Big Sur where I knew everybody in the entire area for many, many years. It was like my family. And I had this calling in my heart to come and do inner city work with very marginalized people. Extremely painterly, very powerful. So this is a passion that I do here. Oh, no, you never get excited. I don't know why not. I often think about what I really want to accomplish at the art project, what my goals are. And one thing is very obvious, and it's clear, it really has happened. And that is, in a way, I'm following the golden rule in terms of doing unto others what you would have done unto you. And if you're an artist, it's very difficult to get a niche where you can paint and there's supportive people around and a place to go to work on your painting and technical support when you need it, but not having it shoved down your throat when you don't want it. And people just saying, your work is great and valid. And that's not only my objectives, but that is what I do at the art project. And it's worked. Doing cocaine is not beautiful. This is beautiful. I have a very nice pair of shoes here. I think they're size seven. They have nice embroidery on them. They're suede. Does anybody want to try them on to see if they'll fit? Like a Cinderella, yeah. Ta -da! <laughs> I'm not quite sure of the size. Oh, okay. There's so many numbers. But I'm in seven there. and a half. I will I'll try. I would take these shoes if they would fit me. I think they're very nice. Look, they're they seven and a half, but it fits me. It fits you good. Whoa. They're yours. Congratulations, Thank Sabrina. you. Whoever is uh, the one who donated this to us here, thank you very much. There, it's actually an artist who donated those. Oh, that's nice. I'm another Whoa, artist. It is an honor. <laughs> that's nice. Do you know anybody who can wear this? Tiny thing? Tiny thing. It's very it's tiny. Nice. It's a big one. It won't fit me either. I think it is very good and will fit Mr. Enrique. Enrique, Enrique try this. Well, it will you. fit you. <laughs> yeah. This is my hometown. It's a nostalgia town, really, when I was five years old. And as you see, it might not be like this anymore. The progress has changed everybody. Are you in this painting anymore? Yes, here it is. Are you me. Is that you? <laughs> yeah. He's painting pictures of joy and happiness and celebration, which is a total opposite of what he's been through the past four or five years. And I admire him. He's trying to go to school part-time. And he's trying to pull himself up. And he's doing a very good job of doing it. But his, his artwork, I think, is paintings of his soul, his true soul, which is joyous. It goes back to, uh, to my early childhood, my first five years. Since then, I, uh, I don't have the pleasure of uh, depicting anything. But my first pure and innocent uh, stage. Sooner or later, my soul is settling down in, in this something like dream-like passion. I was raised in a small village, it's an Indian village. I developed a strong feeling of attraction as to, to this population that were so primitive and 
very fascinating to me. because uh, French is painted. I, I salvage it from the from trash can. Enrique was admitted to the fine arts program at Berkeley and offered a scholarship. He works as a day laborer and has started putting money aside for the trip to Northern California. Me, for me, it's memory work. Takes them to a place that's not now. I grew up in a very rural atmosphere, a farm boy, both in Wisconsin and Southern Illinois. And when I look at a painting like this that I do, it's like I'm searching for a sense of self-esteem and love from the past. I'm borrowing love that I had as a boy. Uh, I had a very happy childhood. It takes them to a place when they were a little more joyful and hopeful. And I think that's very good because it reminds them of what it feels like to be joyful and hopeful and not unhappy and, and struggling. It's a struggle to live down here. Trying to survive and not having anywhere to live and not having anything to eat and not knowing where you're going to get the next meal from and being on the street, trying to stay awake so that you can stay safe, um, being in a safe environment was the hardest, was the hardest. It got even harder when you'd have to keep walking and keep moving constantly because you had nowhere else to go. Well, my little route is coming down here going past the Union. I don't know if you've ever been past the Union mission. If you go by, you look at them kids down there and look what them kids be learning and what they see, OK, and listen to their language. Okay, I would, so I would come by there and listen to that. Then all the little kids that were getting killed in LA, you know, I mean, just dry, innocent drive-bys were going on. So having come up in that environment, having been, you know, affiliated with gangs and stuff of that nature, I feel, you know, I want to do something. And that's what gave me the idea for the coloring book. And I got with my granddaughter. And she started breaking it down where, on a level where kids could read it. So, so every time somebody would come over to the house, she would take the pictures. It was in rough draft, and she would read them. She would read this. I had, to, I had the narrative in one page, and I had the picture. So then what I had her do was to take the narrative and write it on the back of the page. So she would hold the pictures up, and she would read the narrative. And she would do this with everybody come in. I mean, I was thinking, man, people get tired of hearing this book. But everybody would come in the house that would come over to visit, she would do the narrative, and she would read them. This coloring book is dedicated to all the children who have lost loved ones from the prolonged wars in our urban community. Page one, the community had many animals living in it, but the dogs and the cats have been lifelong enemies. Over the years, war had increased, and the streets became the battlegrounds, and peace seemed to be impossible. At the graveyard, D-Dog and Sad Cat Ass. If dogs and cats sworn and natural enemies can live together, why can't bloods and crypts be continued? I mean, what is an artist? Art forms come in all kinds of ways. No such thing as a uh, definition of an artist. I'm from a home city from the uh, Seminole Reservation. And uh, I'm part Seminole, part uh, Creek Indian, which is called Black Indian. I'm a runaway. And uh, I came here, I was about 12, 13 years old. I was on the street fancy because my father had left. My mother, I was two years old then. So I'm coming to California to find my father. So I came out here in uh, 1941, right after the war, and he had left because he was in the service. He, he was what you call a code talker. 
you know, because, you know, he's Indian, blah, blah, blah. And I find him, <laughs> he couldn't recognize me, but I recognized him, see, because I had pictures of him and stuff with this kid, and he had no idea. I was two years old when he left home. And he almost fell out when I told him who I was and everything. You know, I asked him why I didn't leave and see where well, that day. My only outlet is to paint. Painting it takes up <laughs> all my waking hours. And uh, when I go to sleep, that's it. I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking of an idea, you know. Then I think of something, did I paint that or did I dream that up? All the time, I'm constantly thinking of what I could do that nobody has ever seen before. I do uh, oil, acrylics. Sometimes I do uh, what you call uh, clay painting. You take the clay, put water with it, and squeeze out different colors. And we make different uh, color paint that way. You got the black clay, the red clay, you have white clay, and different, you got the lime, and all that stuff. We used to take that it makes it real good. It goes good on uh, brown paper. You know what they use paper bags is? Yeah. A lot of ideas that I have, people don't even believe they exist. For instance, uh, I've been to places where they're uh, using dope. And uh, I record all this in my mind because I don't use dope myself. See, I don't even smoke or anything like that. But uh, I record this. And if you look at the paint, they say, oh, this didn't happen. I say, yes, it did. I say, I guarantee you that it happened. They're in the dope house. And uh, I got five races coming out of the skeleton there. Ghosts of all the different races, red, white, black race, brown race, you know, yellow race, floating in there from the result of the pipe. So that's the smoke coming out of the uh, pipe drains. His pictures typify the destruction that can happen to a person that's on drugs, the destruction of prostitution. And so he expresses that in his work. It's like, you know, being a teacher in some ways. I left here in 1969. I bought a new station wagon. So I traveled. I said, well, I'm going to hit every state in the United States when we have 48 states. It took me four years, right? Each one of these buildings is a building between here and Maine. So I remember a lot of the buildings, so I'd say, I'm gonna put them all on one street and call it Cityscape. This is my own city. It may know, I said, it looks like New York, it looks like LA, it looks like Chicago. So I threw this here, this uh, building in there, that's the uh, building there, my own city. That's nice. Yeah, so gradually I'm uh, I'm Don't learning how to paint. <laughs> You're learning how to paint. I don't want you to learn how to paint. I want you to paint the way you paint. <laughs> a lot of people see a whole lot in this painting that you don't see, even though you're doing it. You're just doing it. I'm just putting, you know. So that's my definition of an artist. Anything that anybody else seeing you, you know, they call you an artist, blah, 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 you know. I like this one. I like them both, but I have to look at my paintings. That's what it is. I just paint. I don't see what I'm painting. I just paint. I know. <laughs> yeah. My mother passed in 96. I'm from Milwaukee, so after she passed, I had been coming out here for like 30 years, back and forth. So after she passed, I decided to make California my home. So this time when I came, I said, I'm going to stay no matter where I live, what I go through, whatever. You know, it was my plan to stay this time. So I came with no money, and this is where God led me to be. And so this is where I am. I was working for a while, but then I, you know, had a Something happened, so I'm not working anymore. But most of the time, I'm at home. When I'm at home, if I'm in bed, and sometimes I'm too lazy to even get up out of bed. So. Mostly, I'm painting things that I don't see a lot of, because, like, I'm from Milwaukee. There's always trees. You know, we live downtown, 
skid row. There's nothing but buildings half of the time. So most of my drawings is of water, mountains, and trees, things that I can't look out my window and see. I call her an expressionist. She throws paint on the canvas and moves it around, and when she's finished, she's finished. Sometimes I have to take it away from her because it's so fantastic. I don't want her to, <laughs> to do any more to it. <laughs> it's a compliment. It's a compliment. Uh, I was just going to mess with the grass. When I came here was to start doing field trips because there wasn't much going on in the way of field trips and that sort of thing. So I took a group, about six or seven of them, to the Museum of Art. Only one of them had been to a museum in their lifetime and the others didn't know where they were going. <laughs> the conversation on the way to the museum was very quiet. Nobody knew where they were going and they were like, oh, we're going on a trip. And when they got to the museum, I had a docent there who gave them a lecture who took them around and showed them the art. We talked about the art. And they all became very excited about what they were looking at. They'd never seen art in person. And art can be very profound when you see it in person. You're from the 1500s and 1400s. And it's just amazing to me that it's, the, um, wow. It's not the same as looking at it in a picture. Mars and Venus. I forget my, uh, my God of War, God of Love. I like the God of uh, Love better than the God of War. And on the way back, the conversation was very lively and excited. And they, did you see that painting? Do you remember that painting? And it was just, they were just all excited. So I thought, you know, what they need down here is fine art. Lillian had the insight to know all of that. And so, yes, yeah, she put it out there. And were people skeptical? Very much so. Uh, they thought, no, nobody's going to want to be an artist in the middle of Skid Row. Uh, nobody's going to come to the art workshop. Just because you're an artist, you think everybody wants to be an artist. Well, she proved them all wrong. They all did want to be an artist. And uh, they've come year after year after year, and all of the works are there to prove it. And we have many, many of their works here in our central office. Like the captain of the ship, I've been the last one to leave Skid Row because Skid Row been good to me. Miss Lillian, the art project. When I came down here, I mean, I was an artist and everything. But Miss Lillian gave me paper. You know, uh, the midnight. I used to go to the midnight mission. They had a warehouse, and they used to give me all the frames I had. So all them pictures you see are frames. I mean, expensive frames. Paper, pens, you know, ink. And then, like I said, I was, I was. Uh, I was doing Kobe's and Shaq's and Iverson's and just all kinds of celebrity art selling. And I was doing portraits. And like I say, now, I mean, look, I'm doing skid row art. People, what do you really have? It's a skid row art or some a Shaq and Kobe? You know what I'm saying? Skid row been good to me. SRO Housing Corporation likes to call it the Central Business District, but it's skid row. <laughs> um, I think it's important to keep it skid row because of the uh, real estate developers. And I just, I think that they'll, you start calling it something else that they'll just try to move in here. And I don't like that when neighborhoods get gentrified and the poor people get thrown out. In my lifetime, I've lived in three cities, Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. In each of these cities, I intentionally moved into low cost neighborhoods so I could pay low rent. And in each of these cities, I had to move three times to avoid the high rents. Well, this is an example of gentrification in the downtown area, what's happening. Uh, very nice cafes going up and buildings being renovated for uh, probably high cost housing. It's not a good thing when people get displaced. In fact, homeless people were an oddity. And then after the rents went sky high in New York City, they were all over the streets. I remember my husband and I going out into the streets and giving them blankets because they were just sitting out in the street in the cold and they were newly homeless. They had newly just been evicted or whatever happened. 
Now that's happening here in Los Angeles. The rents are going sky high. Housing is no longer a necessity. It's a luxury. It's an investment. And it's causing women and children and families to, to end up on the street now. I live in the industrial district. It's also happening down there. But it was built for artists to live and work. All the lofts aren't rent controlled, but this one I'm living in is rent controlled. I also moved in here because the rent was low. And now what's happening is the place has been discovered and everybody wants to move here now. It's very difficult to be an artist in America. There's very few artists that make a living at it. I think it's like 1%. And I'm married to an actor, the same thing with actors. I think 1% make a living in the business. He's not famous, but he makes a living. He makes a very good living as an actor. I don't know. I have to look at it. When I was in prison, it was, I met a professor from UCLA, and he, would t he encouraged me to study art. I had never read about Van Gogh or Picasso, and I heard about them. I ain't read about them, so I started to read about them. And I'm a history buff. I love history. And when I was reading about them, and they tell a story, they always would tell the times in which they lived in, you know, the political climate. And by me being a political man, I, I'm, I'm identifying I love history. And I realized that artists, some being apolitical, they reflect the times that they live in. And I thought that the skid row art was my connection to the time that I live in, OK? I draw some Tupac. I love Tupac because he reflects the time in which I, we live in, okay? I mean, I got an outline. I got the outline. And sometimes I use one brush. And even though the colors won't be the exact color I want, I can, I can start distinguishing different. Even this is not really where I want it yet. But the colors allow me to see, separate the different areas that I want to deal with. Really, what I, when I paint, I paint lines. So if I see a line like this here, I might... Throw, throw a mark down here. That just gives me my line. You know, if I want some, if I see these lines over here, I'll just put, I'll just put something there. It may not be the tone I want at that particular time. Basically, this right here is an is a, is a outline. Even though it looks kind of good, though. It do look kind of good, I got. But it is an outline to me. It's not the finished product, you know. I'm just looking, I'm searching for lines. A lot of things were in here and in here that I never, had the opportunity or, or, or knew how to bring out. So uh, what kind of artist I am, I don't know. I, I really don't know yet, you know. I guess that's going to be my connection with the world. Uh, so yeah, I'm an artist, but I think uh, probably everybody's an artist in some, some form or fashion. Everyone has their perception of the world, and um, we're trained to see the world the way we're trained to see it. And I believe there's other layers. I believe there's other uh, worlds that we can't see. And of course, life itself, it's like, what's that all about? We're born, we live, we die. But that's what my work is about. It's about the, the mystery of existence. Living here in this loft and being able to make a mess and make my art and having a job, a part-time job to go to that uh, gives me stability is great. I'm very happy. And I'm very happy in this community and that community downtown at Skid Row. The Italian expression is uh, amiamo che cosa stiamo facendo. We love what we're doing. Oh, yes, yeah, I did apply for Berkeley. I went two times to the to university, and I, I, I applied, and they took me in. But I, I failed in one of the basic requirements, and I have a very um, outstanding works. Outstanding, us, but it's not because I, I like my works, it's not because uh, people saw what I was doing and was working on, on this, on this, on, on, on my creations, that. So what was the requirement that you didn't have? Well, I, I have done. <laughs> well, one of the requirements is that um, I am not American citizen. I, I, 
That's all the basic, the basic idea. Yeah. So scholarship was the most important. What Enrique was finding so difficult to tell us was that because of his immigration status, he couldn't receive the scholarship. I'm not teaching, I'm not a teacher. I'm encouraging fine arts and encouraging them to see art around them and to see art uh, made by other artists. In fact, how this gallery show came about is that I was in a show at LA Art Corps, a juried show, so I took my artist on a field trip to see the gallery show. The director of the gallery was there at the de front desk when I brought them in. We started walking around the gallery and my artist started talking about the art in a very intelligent way because they'd been to museums, they listened to docents, they listened to me telling them about, you know, what's good art and what makes a good painting. And she was amazed at, at what they were talking about. And she said, Lillian, I would like to see their art. <laughs> about three or four months later, she came to the art workshop. She said, this is great. I want to start showing this work. And, and to make a long story short, she scheduled this show for the artist to have a show. And it's been very successful, and it's been wonderful. During the four years we worked on Humble Beauty, things got worse for the homeless. The number of tents tripled in one year. Then the city ordered the police to crack down on Skid Row. Some good came of it. Drug dealers and other felons were arrested, but everyone was hassled, and many homeless dispersed to other parts of the city temporarily. When the heat is off, they'll be back. This map, available on the web, tracks the changes in LA's downtown homeless population every two weeks, like the progress of a disease. You know, they just move the homeless from place to place to place, and um, they, they go away for a while, and then they spring up again and then it gets bad, and then they take care of it again. So it's like a, um, uh, a revolving door to where they don't ever solve the problem. I think that you can't tell somebody, um, the homeless, that, that you can't be here without offering them an alternative. Politicians talk a lot about Skid Row, but little is ever done for the people there. The Skid Row artists are no longer homeless largely through the efforts of SRO Housing Corporation and the LAMP community. The artists make the best of the place they live. They've converted an old firehouse into an art gallery and cultural center. OG Man got a part-time job working with inner city kids. He organizes events on Skid Row for Father's Day and coloring contests for children. He is constantly creating things, new paintings, new internet sites, cautionary tales for children, even a clothing line. He became a father again in his mid-fifties. He adores his baby son and is determined to make a better life for Manny Jr. Lillian continues to create her own paintings and work for SRO Housing. She keeps the Skid Row Art Workshop, a vital, ongoing institution. Lillian shows her work in many galleries, and she was recently commissioned by the city of Hawthorne, California, to do a series of paintings for police headquarters. Most visitors to the police station have never been exposed to abstract spiritual art in person, and we can hear her saying, what they need here is fine arts. Lucille continues to paint the things she cannot see on Skid Row, 
while Barbara sets up her easel in the tiny overcrowded park and draws only what she sees. I saw a man with a cart and he had four big bundles on that one cart. One on this side, one on that side, one in the back, one under there. And he's pushing, it looked like it take 10 men to push it. And he's pushing hard. He's pushing, I can see in his face, and he's real skinny. He's pushing hard, I said, oh, I'd like to draw that man. I drew it in my mind real fast. So I got a picture of that man. I, I'm gonna put it on paper, because I drew it in my mind real fast. Do you have a picture of him? Can you show me later? No, it's in my mind still. I'll be a painter all my life. So I don't want to change it for nothing in the world. So in the past, I was so fearful. I was scared of what's going on, what will I end up. But now I can see clearly my goals. I might not be famous, I might not be rich, but I, I will enjoy every minute of my, of my abilities. Although Enrique still hasn't gotten to Berkeley, he keeps working on his art and his life and is grateful for his reborn identity as a painter. He's sold several paintings at Skid Row exhibitions and downtown galleries. The hurdles of, the, of uh, the daily life, um, it hinders me. But when I turn my mind into uh, myself, I get free. Astrid continues to paint her striking portraits and now attends college. Darlene works on new paintings based on Rory's photos and hopes to have an exhibition of her own soon. Vitautis illuminates the fantasy world of children with his delightful watercolors and reflects the darker side of his life on the edge through his poetry publications. Rory photographs the gritty injustices on Skid Row and then paints the hidden spirits he feels in the air all around downtown. This is Soshi, a homeless woman he depicts as goddess of Skid Row. She removes a pervasive barbed wire surrounding it. Rory perseveres in leading the Lamp Art Project on the thinnest of financial shoestrings. together in one hand, we're, we're all one people. And before the century is gone, I think, everybody be the same color <laughs> because they're mixing like mad now. And about, oh, oh another hundred years, be one color. Joaquin Roebuck envisioned and painted an all-inclusive world where all the cities are one city, all the races melt together, fathers never abandon their families, sons don't run away, and all the people on Skid Row are treated just like everybody else. Because I won't be around, you know, to say, I told you so. <laughs> no, I used to think about death, but I don't think about it anymore. I, just, I take it one day at a time. I say, I'm going to do this today. If I don't wake up in the morning, OK. Painting gave Joaquin the serenity to stop worrying about death and the philosophy to take things one day at a time. Joaquin died at the age of 75. We remember him and his paintings, all their paintings, and all the people who create this wonderful, living, humble beauty.
I joined Lillian's art workshop did I begin to paint. Before that time, I never touched a brush, never felt like it, because I didn't have anything to say. And this is the very first oil painting I've ever done. And under Lillian's guidance, I, I learned a way to just go ahead, just do it. And my God, I did it. And I've been following that muse ever since.